Pons' brigade. McAllister retreated in the uh, face of Pons' attack. They came back to this position. He reestablished his 324 pounders here, and he's ready to hold off anybody that should attack from this direction. Over there, just a few feet, what is left of the 7th, in, uh, 7th Illinois Regiment from, uh, McClure, from uh, uh, Wall Sweeney's Brigade of Wallace's Division. And uh, they are the left flank of this side of the defense. And as you look straight up the road, you'll see that open forest. And if they could have seen that far that day, I doubt it because of the, because of the uh, smoke and all, but if they could have seen that far that day, they would have seen the backside of Confederate formations passing up and out of these forests onto that open ground, orienting to the south, and they would have seen General Prentice and his 2,250 defenders of the hornet's nest captured and bagged over there. They probably couldn't have seen it. Even if they could have, they were far too weak by this time of the afternoon to do anything about it. The best they could hope to do was hold this position, and that turned out to be impossible. So we have one more stop to explain that, and it's just down the trail here, and within a few steps, you'll be able to see Veach's headquarters monument, and that's where we're going. <laughs> Was the 14th and the 25th Indiana, you did it. You followed them all the way back to their camp from the point where they were repelled, driven from the, uh, their position near Review Field. Uh, in the afternoon, uh, what time does that say, Steve, on the tablet? Uh, 5 At about 5 p.m., uh, they reached this position, so, yeah, we... We're roughly the time of Pond's attack right now, but uh, at uh, 5 p.m. they reach this position, uh, and for this could have been a time for them to rest and take a breather and realize that things were going to be okay, but that's not the way that worked out. Uh, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, we're going to account for the other two regiments first. The 15th and the 46th Illinois participated in the counterattack on the opposite end of Sherman and McClernand's line. They were driven back to Jones Field, and then they were driven back across Tillman Branch, at which point Colonel Davis of the 46th decided that he wanted his regiment to get lunch. And so they marched back to their camp, and the 46th Illinois ate lunch. And uh, it was probably a good idea. Uh, I'm sure the men needed it, and they also got more ammunition and they got reorganized. Uh, but they also stayed at the camp, and so by the end of the battle, uh, they were in a position, their camp was right over here, uh, by the end of the battle they were in a position where they marched out of their camp, moved slightly down this road, and if you went down this road you'd get to the entrance of the National Park, uh, where you pulled into the National Park this morning. You go up over there is the visitor center, and over there is the hornet's nest. Um, they finally ended the day helping to secure the right flank of McClernand's division. Uh, and indeed, they stayed with McClernand all the next day and participated in the counterattack uh, with McClernand's division. The 15th Illinois was so badly chewed up from that flank attack, they'd lost both of their commanders, Colonel Ellis and Major Goddard, both dead out on that initial line. Uh, they broke up and they retreated back uh, to Grant's last line, which is back over here. Which brings us to the 14th and the 25th. As you can see by the tablets up here, this tablet here, and if you get into the road and look down the way, you're gonna see more blue tablets facing that way. For a while on the afternoon, around five o'clock on the afternoon, it should have looked like McClernand and Sherman and Veach were getting to a condition where they could take a breath and dig in and hold the position. Um, of course, they did not know that they had defeated the last Confederates in their front as most of the Confederate Army had peeled off to capture the hornet's nest. Uh, they were still subject to artillery fire and a good number of Confederate guns uh, were in Jones Field shooting this way. And that 
is when exhaustion and panic took over. After an entire day of valorous fighting, of very bloody combat, of counterattacking and driving the Confederates from their front, at about five o'clock, with no clear explanation, this entire line of battle here just panicked, fell into a into disorganization and fled back through the camps of Veach's headquarters in the 44th uh, Indiana and some other, uh, or the 25th Indiana and some, uh, some people, some areas back there. Falling straight back toward what would be, you've already rode along as the entry, Pittsburgh Landing Road. You pulled into the front of the, uh, the entrance to the park, you drove down the road to the visitor center, they fell back to that road. Quite frankly, that had to have been the moment on April 6th when Grant's army was most vulnerable. When Grant's army was most vulnerable. By that time, Colonel Webster had established his final line in front of Pittsburgh Landing, those, all those cannons. And we see, we've, done the, we've all done the Dill Branch walk at one time or another. And so Colonel Webster is ready for any Confederates to try to attack across Dill Branch. But in this area, in the area west of that, the Army of the Tennessee, what's left, in, uh, left of it is just falling apart briefly. Now, unfortunately for the Confederates, unfortunately for the Federals, the vast majority of the Confederate Army is otherwise engaged. They're rounding up 2,250 prisoners with General Prentiss and marching them off to prison pen. The only other infantry force that could have tested the waters here and found that there was nothing, that there was no resistance, was Colonel Pond's brigade that had just been decimated in that ill-advised attack upon McAllister's battery. So it's a, it's a what if, but it's a long what if. For about 30 minutes to an hour, these guys fell apart. They ran back to Grant's last line. Their officers did rally them. They did fall back into line. The 14th and the 25th marched to the east and eventually reached the siege guns and helped protect those. Um, but within 30 minutes to an hour, the, the Grant's last line back here at the Pittsburgh Landing Road was reestablished. And the men had calmed down and they'd fallen into, they gotten organized and fallen into line and started to get ammunition and so on and so forth. But for a time, there was, if, so, if the Confederates could have done something about it, the Confederates could not have done something about it. For a time, this part of Grant's last line was open. This brings us to the end of uh, the travails and the travels of Veach's brigade. Uh, like I said, they come across as a just one of Grant's brigades. Uh, usually in the battle, in the histories of the battle, they're 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 in there. Usually the part of the fighting in the uh, uh, along the main Corinth Road, and then they kind of disappear after that. Uh, so in the narrative of the history, they're they play their part and they step off the stage, but in fact, they themselves had to fight the entire battle. The battle didn't end for them when the historians stopped looking at them. Uh, and they fell back, they participated in the counterattack. They continued to fall back fighting through this area. They drove back the last serious, helped drive back the last serious Confederate attack on this part of the line. And when the sun went down on April 6, 1862, and General Grant's army was still standing. Veach's brigade had at least, could at least say they had kept their places in the line of battle warm. So thanks for coming out today. I have time for questions, um, but uh, 
we have uh, 30 minutes before we need to move those cars. <laughs> uh, and we're about, I'd say we're about 10 to 15 from where they are right now. Thank you, Bjorn. He was wounded at Shiloh, and he had to recover from that wound. Uh, he returned to duty, and he was promoted to uh, Brigadier General, and uh, commanded um, brigades, and then um, brigades for about a year, and then during the uh, Atlanta campaign, uh, he commanded a division in the 16th Corps. So when Sherman marched to Atlanta, Veach was one of his division commanders. He was wounded again in the Atlanta campaign, and that, was, uh, that knocked him out of the war. Uh, turned out to be a uh, uh, disabling wound. Uh, but he survived and he went back to Indiana and lived quietly in... Uh, so did he ever get elected to office? I do not believe he ever got elected to office. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not believe he ever changed his uh, party affiliation either. All right, well, let's head on back toward the, the cars.